All right. Good morning. Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure to, to talk to you and to discuss this topic. My name is Kevin Komisarek. I am a professor of Oregon at the University of Toronto here. I've been here since 2000, 2003. Um, and in the last year, I've spent, uh, I've been on sabbatical, research sabbatical, and I've spent the last year living uh, with this technology, with virtual technology. It's been of interest to me. I'm uh, conventionally trained. Um, I went to McGill um, and uh, conventionally trained a, a performer, performer, performance uh, specialist. Um, but over the course of the years where I've seen this technology develop, it's piqued my interest in terms of what kind of utility it, uh, it, it presents to us as musicians and how we can uh, explore this technology <coughs> in a way that, <coughs> excuse me, that is artistically uh, substantial and that really explores the full range of expressive ability in the technology. Um, I think there's a tendency to, to look at, at technology as not inherently expressive and we'll talk about that. Um, but I wanted to see what kind of uh, approach is necessary in order to make the technology as expressive as possible. Is it possible? So I spent the last year uh, living and breathing this tech and uh, getting inside of it, um, trying to discover all its various idiosyncrasies, its quirks, um, its, its strengths, its weaknesses, how to navigate around those, uh, what kinds of opportunities this presents to musicians um, for innovation, whether in performance or in composition, uh, what kind of creative tool uh, uh, does, this, uh, does this become for us. Um, so the purpose of today is to, is to share some of what I found with you and to discuss, discuss it, discuss its implications, get your feelings about it. I think, I think we can maybe start quickly with just maybe some presentations of each other because it's a fairly small group and I think I'd be interested to hear whether any of you have experience with virtual technology, what your, what your background is, your interest is in the instrument. Uh, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, well, I started out probably 40 years ago with MIDI, obviously, in building systems. And, and I would like to get into this technology, mainly because I'm going to be downsizing and such, and I'm not moving for all this. But it, it's uh, the challenge is, is to operate in technology. Okay, thank you. And that's often more interesting. Okay. That's my intent. All right, great. Thank you very much. How about you? I'm not really a technical person, so I know what Jeremy is saying about this, but yeah. I'm pretty sure about the importance of the future. Okay. All right, thanks. How about you? Well, I had seen virtual technologies like this uh, in, uh, in previous uh, inventions, probably dated back, let's say, 20 years ago. And I found out that they did with this uh, sense of the type of this kind of thing. And I also did learn that the Constance Holman Company made the first organs to design their own organs. Yeah. And which they say makes a different founder of all the building firms. Yep, I see. I should just mention that I have no affiliation with Classic at all. I'm not an agent of the company. Um, Classic has donated this instrument very graciously for the purpose of this workshop and, uh, and, and the academic uh, study uh, that uh, I'm sort of trying to, to uh, uh, incorporate into, into today's presentation. But uh, I have no personal stake in the company. How about you? I'm a listener. OK. I'm not an artist. I'm just interested in how they sound. OK, thanks. Um, I'm just interested because it seems like technology is the future, so we need to, to learn from this. And also, I'm, I'm an organist, but I also am an engineer. So oh, cool. I'm interested in how this works. Very cool. Wow, that's very cool. Thanks very much. Um, I grew up in the tracker new world tradition. Mm -hmm. Inside of you know, the time of university, that um, you know, there's no money in music, so it became a computer guy. Mm. Um, and now I'm totally retired from that, and I'm doing just music. But I've been a healthcare guy for the last five, six years, something like okay. that. Um, and I'm currently retrofitting an old Johannes uh, 
keyboard and pedal combination and retrofitting for a MIDI so that I can run it to my LFF. Oh, cool. Okay, thanks very much. How about you? We have a hybrid situation, mm -hmm. and my main problem is finding samples that do not have acoustics oh. attached to it. Okay. I don't want to use it for the real thing. Just the aha, uh -huh. okay, so and that's. In a... I'm very told with the tenor range, we can tell you something, and more clearly it's all the Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. okay. Okay, so I'll try to address some of those concerns in the presentation today. Thanks very much. Hi. Hi, Hi come on in. That's okay. I got lost. I think you don't That's all right. Just a heads up. The, the, the workshop's being recorded, so if you don't want to be on camera, the back seat is off camera. The back row is off okay. camera. It's up to you. All right. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, how about you? Either one of you. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. And they were just I see. Okay. And, and bikes for cell phones. I mean, we have great online education Yeah. But we still have a physical virtual technology. Okay, great. I mean, that works. Well, well, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, supplemental to older organs that just need some additions to it that can't afford it. I see. Okay. All right, great, thank you. John, you have Yes, as for me, I'm a former church organist now focusing on music production, using pop work uh, for the, for the, <clears throat> as a cover artist, uh, using pop work for the open covers that I produce for YouTube. And, uh, yeah. Great, all right, thank you so much. And you work for Classic. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Just great. Just to work for them as Okay, well. right, thanks, thanks very much. Morning everybody, I'm Tom Chase. I was at the, uh, Regina for many years. I enjoyed a 1929 pass in 1993. I retired after the post, and I'm looking for something that doesn't disturb the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. All right, thanks so much. Now we haven't heard from you both. We're just sort of just sharing your interest or background in the virtual instruments or not. Some of that optimization, okay. Um, all right, that's great to, to know your interest in that. I'll try to work that in. Thanks very much. How about you? Um, so I used to be a classic musician and had a job as a music director, but I kind of mostly jumped ship a few years ago. Now I really think very music. Oh, cool. So I do work with recording on video a lot, and usually it would be my producer that would deal with kind of the sound. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Okay, this is really great to hear your backgrounds and your interests. <clears throat> um, the focus that I would sort of uh, move this workshop in uh, towards is uh, how to make the technology itself be expressive as a, as a medium. Um, so I'll try to work in some of these interests uh, as well re with regard to customization, uh, both in acoustic and, and overall uh, the, the palette of sound um, as well to try to uh, bring that in. But to, I, I thought I'd maybe start by finding points that we can really agree on. I mean, a virtual organ is not without controversy in a, in a, in a community that is very passionate about acoustic instruments and whose members have been trained on acoustic instruments. So to have this, this sort of new kid on the block, <laughs> this new 20-some-year-old kid on the 30-year-old kid on the block, um, uh, changing uh, regularly, uh, developing in its, in its capacities uh, and its sophistication um, is challenging. It's challenging, and so one of the reasons that <clears throat> I uh, have spent as much time with it as I have 
both to get inside the, the, the instrument, but also to discover what it's capable of, and also to work on how to bridge uh, the world of acoustic instruments and acoustically trained musicians and this sort of new frontier, uh, relatively new frontier. Um, so I think we can all agree that on two things. One, that um, uh, one of the central challenges to organ as an instrument to, to, in our time is barriers to access. Uh, I would define barriers to access in, in a number of ways that I'll, that I'll go through, but barriers to access being one of, the, one of the primary central challenges facing us as organists, and that virtual technology, uh, the second thing I think we can agree on, is that virtual technology does offer us some solutions to those barriers. So uh, what are the barriers? I see four broad categories of them. The first, systemic barriers. Systemic barriers to access would really encompass expectations that we uh, form as a community of organists, a community of practice, um, around what an organist is, who, the, who they are or who they're not, um, uh, what faith community do they belong to, what belief systems do they uh, subscribe to, ascribe to, um, what values do they hold as musicians, as individuals. I mean, we do have certain uh, expectations uh, around that in the community. Uh, and so someone who doesn't come from that uh, belief system or that history, that background, didn't grow up in church, um, is sometimes faced with a systemic barrier to becoming an organist because they don't talk and sound like what we expect. And so from my perspective as an educator, seeing people come through an education system, um, not everyone's growing up on the coattails of a music director as children and then moving through and becoming organist specialists when they uh, reach university age, but that is very different from there not being people who are interested in the instrument. So if they come up against those barriers that can sometimes say, well, I'm going to go into piano because I don't have any, or voice, or sound engineering because I don't have that kind of mentorship community uh, ready for me. So the virtual technology sort of democratizes that whole landscape a little bit in a way that is useful and I think addresses that barrier. Um, we have geographic barriers to access. Really good instruments, we often have to get on a plane and go somewhere to play them. Uh, not everyone can do that. It's great for people who can, but if someone can't, they're, faced a, they're facing a wall. So this is portable, it's uh, uh, compact, it can be uh, uh, moved very easily and set up very quickly. Um, in a way that uh, is uh, very helpful for that particular barrier, geographic barrier. We have economic barriers to access. You have to pay for a plane ticket. <laughs> you have to be able to afford that trip. You need to be able to afford uh, uh, that, uh, that access. So this makes it a little bit easier for that because it moves us out of that geographic, uh, that geographic question. There's physical barriers to access. Not everyone can climb the steps to the organ loft. It's not easy for everyone to do. And sometimes it's a complete non-starter. Very few instruments have level access. Uh, this makes it much easier uh, to do. We have level access here. There are ways to adapt pedal board. There's many different ways that the instrument can be made accessible to people who have specific accessibility needs uh, in a way that the conventional instrument does not uh, accommodate. So these are all useful things, I think, to keep in mind. Uh, one of the key pieces, I think, relevant pieces here in the virtual tech is that it decouples the instrument from physical space. So we're not attached to a physical space in order to have access to that instrument. And we're also not attached to, the instrument is not attached to any one person or group. We don't have to take the priest to lunch and ask for the keys. <laughs> We don't have to charm anyone to, to, to convince them that we're worthy or we studied with the right person or we talk the right way or we're interested in the right kind of music or playing a certain way or not playing a certain way in order to play the instrument. We can sit down and we can play it. Anyone can do it. So it's very useful. It's self-contained in that way. Hey, come on in. Welcome, welcome. Enter, enter the citadel of knowledge. We're <laughs> it's great to have you today. The workshop's on camera, so if you'd rather not be on camera, that back row is off camera, just so you know. Um. 
the virtual tech gives us a self, a very, I think, a very a valuable archival uh, utility. If an instrument is destroyed from fire or flood or earthquake or whatever is happening in our world, it seems to be happening a lot, um, and we have an archive of an instrument that we want to reproduce or restore, um, uh, uh, an acoustic instrument, this virtual technology is very useful in helping us do that. It's very precisely sampled and makes that easy to do. There's a very useful, uh, uh, I would say, um, cost output ratio between uh, the investment that you make in an instrument and the utility it gives you. So you can have a very useful, very functional setup with a MIDI controller from you know, a kid's keyboard that you bought from the grocery store can this can run help work. So actually, if you decide that you're going to get yourself a, uh, if you're into, into Spanish music and you want to get a 16th century sample of a Spanish instrument that's one keyboard, I mean, you can set yourself up pretty well um, with, a, with a very small investment. So I see that ratio, what you get out of it versus what you absolutely need to put into it is, is quite beneficial. It's a fairly generous ratio. So you don't need an elaborate setup. You can have one, but you don't absolutely need it. And so this is something that, that is unique to the, the virtual platform, and I think something that, uh, that it's uh, important to consider in mitigating these barriers. I'd see most of the criticism that comes from the virtual tech comes through us comparing it to acoustic instruments. So what I see is that it's possible to make the instrument much more expressive much more inherently uh, uh, useful if we really look at it as a separate instrument. So it's a different beast. It's a different kind of an instrument. So we have a uh, tracker, mechanical action, <coughs> EP, <coughs> excuse me, electro-pneumatic, digital, and virtual. So if we approach it differently, <coughs> excuse me, and, and approach it with its own kind of performance practice, we can create something that is, I think, much more expressive than if we sit down and we just try to pretend that it's something that it isn't. Um, so think of it as a fourth kind of an instrument, one that really is a hybrid between uh, a reproduced acoustic instrument and a natively synthetic one. Um, the other thing I find is useful about the virtual tech is that the, it sensitizes us to variables in the response of the instrument that improve, raise our awareness and our skills when we move back to acoustic instruments. Because we're focused on the response of the instrument, we're trying to accommodate it and create expression from it. It puts certain kinds of aspects of your keyboard approach, your attack, um, your manner of thinking about registration, your manner of interacting with the acoustic around you, in a way that I think is sometimes automatized when we're not playing virtually. Um, so that when you get into the acoustic environment, your sensitivity is raised and you're thinking about things in a new way. And so this is useful. It's sort of like the faults of the virtual tech actually are beneficial. They make us stronger musicians. I think pedagogically it's very useful for that as well. Um, you know, the, the, the the title of this workshop is around coaxing expressivity from the instrument. And I mean, that, I think that term is maybe problematic uh, to begin with, this idea that we, have to, we should have to coax anything to be expressive if, if it's a high quality instrument. So, I mean, ideally any instrument is going to be inherently expressive. But I think we have this automatic response to say, well, acoustic instruments are inherently expressive, virtual instruments are inherently not expressive without really actually defining what does it mean for an instrument to be expressive? What does that mean for an acoustic instrument to be expressive? Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I have a few. Uh, we start by maybe this idea that really good instruments give us a sense that they're sort of reading us, right? We don't have to do a lot in order to get a very palpable response from it. So subtle inputs in the way we play produce very noticeable reactions. And there is a great variety of the kinds of reactions that we can get. So there's a lot of nuance and detail that's possible. Um, you know, the phrase, good instruments are good teachers. 
are the best teachers, right? The best teacher is a good instrument. I think that relates to that idea that every little thing that you do is going to create an effect. So that's what a good instrument does. A tracker can be so sensitive as it will respond to thoughts that you have in your dreams. It could be a slur, it could be an articulation, a little timing pause, whatever it is, and that we don't have to put a lot of effort into that. Um, any other thoughts about what makes a good, what makes an instrument expressive in your view? Any ideas, like in your experience? Yeah. Oh, I thought I saw. No. Any, any, you think about a moment where you played and you say, wow, this is really, this is really good. This really works for me or this feels good or it sounds right. Do you have any memories of that or any experience of that? Well, I have a, 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 a virtual work we, at home. Yeah, yes. sure. And uh, as a composer, it, you know, depending on uh, what I'm envisioning, I can, having the access to very simple sets that, uh, in different schools of art and building, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think really gives uh, gives one a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a, a big palette of sound, the ability to experiment, for sure. I think that's huge. I mean, that speaks to the idea of voicing and how an instrument's been designed. How much color does it give us to play with? How, how what kinds of different sounds and uh, and expressive devices are in built into the the voicing and the uh, the registration, uh, the stop disposition of the instrument. Any other thoughts? Yeah. So, my experience brought back instruments, which can be a journey where you sort of inside, on the back of the instrument, it's this thing around you. You don't yeah. actually listen to the instrument to do so much to see your head and hear what's doing in the room, right? Yeah, so totally. And the touch changes from manual to manual, and not depending on how much you got a couple of them, you have this business of it doesn't give you that immediacy yeah. this is so beautifully said and i think it, it really summarizes that i mean what you're describing and, and this is so key to some of the real points that, that stick out for me in the, in the, in the comparison to the virtual environment. Um, that, that relationship to space and that tactile uh, interaction. Um, thank you for that. I think you know, the, the, the essence of, of becoming proficient with an expressive instrument is that there's this <coughs> feedback loop that develops between what you do and what you get back. And we become very uh, accustomed to that loop and so we know what it feels like in our body to get a response what does it take for, what do we need to do in order to get that response and then we kind of dance with the instrument in a very seamless way and it becomes integrated and we don't think about it we just do it so the problem is if you're coming from that that beautifully finely oiled machine <laughs> of feedback between you and the instrument and then you sit down here it gets disrupted. So the thing about the virtual platform is that it disrupts that feedback loop because the, of the nature of the platform, because it is synthetic, but that is very different from not being able to create a new feedback loop, to develop a new feedback loop. So there's some adaptations that need to occur in that feedback loop in order for that same kind of sensation to develop. And it's highly variable based on your sample set and your setup and all of that. But really mainly in terms of how, what kind of attention are you paying to the response of the instrument. Um, so you have come from this highly optimized flow state and then this, this platform can disrupt that. But that doesn't mean that you can't work with it. The challenge of the tech is that it forces us to relearn some aspects of that. Uh, because the variables are different, and I'll talk about those. Uh, if we just go at it like any kind of an organ, um, we f can find that the results are, are unpredictable, sometimes suboptimal. Um, and I think that is what feeds the bias that we see against virtual organs. That is why. You say, well, it doesn't, it doesn't respond. It's, you know, 
it's a toaster, <laughs> you know. But we get that, and it's not. It's it's. I I don't think it's it's accurate uh, an assessment. It requires a different kind of an approach. So if you think of it as a different kind of instrument, then you're halfway there. Okay, I see the solution as we develop um, uh, proficiency with this with this platform. It's key to think about the associations, the new associations between physical sensations and auditory outcomes. So paying attention to those two things. Um, in order to do this, I propose that you consider three, what I would say, three arenas of your experience when you're sitting down at these instruments. Spatial, a spatial arena, a tactile arena, and a proprioceptive arena. Um, these, they overlap. These arenas definitely overlap, but I think they have some distinct uh, attributes. The spatial arena, I would say, relates to all aspects of the, of the soundscape in the synthetic acoustic. So whether that's a wet acoustic that kind of fights with your native acoustic in your, in your, in your uh, acoustic setup, uh, or uh, a dry acoustic in a sample set, a dry sample set, or a very wet one, which is what we have today. Um, that's going to impact your experience, and you'll need to account for it. It's very different from, from the, uh, the presence of sitting at a console. I'll talk about why in a second. Um, so this could be your setup, your speakers, the amount of reverb that you have in your sample set or that you've set, the temperament that you choose of your instrument or the way that the instrument is voiced. All of this, for me, falls into the spatial arena of your, of your experience. The tactile arena, I think, relates to all the features, all of the associations um, that we experience in the space and the time between something that we do and something that we hear in response. So everything that involves your body actually attacking or touching the keyboard, every aspect of that and every aspect of what you hear. Um, the proprioceptive arena, I think, is where some of the biggest differences exist. And this is really uh, everything that involves your experience of your physical body as you play. So this can be associations between what you experience in balance and gravity and coordination in your body and the various sounds that come out of the organ and when, and when they come out of the organ. So this is a very different experience when you're playing virtually. So the feeling in your body. Uh, we often navigate this just by feel. We don't even think about it. You sit down and you go, riding a bicycle, all of this. We've all heard that. Uh, and in the virtual world, that, that feel and sound link is altered. So you've got to adjust for it. You've got to think there's some techniques I'll, I'll, I'll propose to you to consider to do that. It's less predictable, the response, based on your setup, based on your sample set. That loop is not always going to be the same across all sample sets. You might have a really good one that responds very keenly or a really good MIDI controller on one keyboard and a, and a spongier one on another one, and you're not going to get that same response every time. So it may not be as repeatable, and it may not be as predictable. We just have to adapt to it. Um, so a key piece here is to remember that not all of these setups are created equal. Right? You can have different materials, whether it's the weight of the key based on the construction of the key. We have solid core, uh, solid wood here. We have plastic here, very light, heavier. Um, you know, there's a reason that harpsichord keys are hollowed out underneath because the return is much faster. So we don't have that here. So there's a heavier feel. Um, but you don't have to have that. Right? You can play something very light, plastic. You might like plastic. You might not. But if you want something that's quick, you're better off with plastic than something heavy, even though this sort of, you'll feel the fantasy more <laughs> if you're playing a wood keyboard. But if you want to speak to your instrument, that might not be the right setup. So keeping that in mind, the speed of your, uh, and the memory of your machine, uh, all of these things can impact your experience, your proprioceptive experience uh, profoundly. The setup of your speakers, you know, you might love the idea of 10 speakers you know, run through the ceiling and one upstairs and one at the subway station down the street and a sub 10 subwoofers and, you know, and the dogs are howling. But, you know, 
that might be cool, you might enjoy that, but it's going to change how it feels to you when you play. And if you want to stay in control of the music, maybe that's not the best idea, right? Um, so the, the ability to use headphones is huge. It allows you to monitor the response of the technology, the instrument, um, uh, to a very precise degree. So this is sometimes preferable even to, to, to elaborate speaker setups. All right. So let's start with, so proprioceptive, spatial, and tactile. So let's start with proprioceptive, a top break. Let's sort of drill down into that a little bit. I think the, the virtual tech is really distinct in, in giving you, and, and what it is so different about, uh, the way it is so different, it is exactly what you said, is that it gives you this dual perspective, this simultaneous perspective of being the player and the listener at the same time. Why? Because the samples are coming from a microphone position. So what you're hearing when you play is the perspective of someone listening to the instrument out in the hall, out in the church. This is very unusual. You describe the experience of being inside. That's exactly what you are. You're inside the instrument when you play, especially the kind of instrument you're describing. Yet when you're playing that instrument on a sample set, you're playing it from the perspective. What you're hearing is coming from the perspective of, of much, much further away. So this I call, uh, we're doing something close. You feel it close in your body. This is why I say it's proprioceptive. You feel it in your body very closely, but you're hearing it far away. So this I call a proximity disjunction because we are used to that experience being much more unified. So how do you, what, first of all, what happens to that, to you when, when that happens? Um, you'll find often coordination issues in your pedal. All of a sudden, your pedal will be lagging. You, you might find that you're losing rhythm, rhythmic precision, rhythmic energy, rhythmic drive in the playing. You might find that you start cacking wrong notes and, and the accuracy that you're used to having isn't there, but maybe not clear why that is. Um, uh, your tempos might drag. You might find it harder to keep the tempo moving forward because of all of that. Um, so you might say, well, okay, I'm losing tempo and I'm losing rhythmic drive, so I'm going to just make my articulation sharper. Okay? But then you listen to it and you say, well, I'm clipping the sound. I'm clipping the notes. The articulations are too short. So all of this can be really frustrating. You sit down and you'll be like, I thought I was pretty good. And now, like, I'm messing up and what's going on? And it can be very, very disheartening. <laughs> so... Let me give you an example. Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to play it two ways, all right? This is some book studio opening. And um, it's a very wet acoustic, so for those of you who are not loving that, I apologize in advance, it's a, it's a very wet sample. Um, you know, there's a book studio, C major prelude, opening of the C major prelude, 136. And, and um, I'll play it just like what I would do if I was sitting down at a tracker you know, in Germany, and just, you know, knowing that the instrument is going to read everything I do and be really with me and really close under my hand, okay? because I'm lost in this, in this sound, in this wave of sound. The rhythm isn't clear, my body's disoriented. So it just fall, it falls apart. So it's not really a comfortable experience. So the approach here is to think about the, 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 the rhythm primarily is the thing that communicates the music into the body, right? So creating slightly larger breaks and making these breaks a little bit earlier. So the need to release up sooner becomes more paramount so that you create more space. <laughs>
you get a little bit more structure, more energy there, and so the body doesn't become disoriented. It stays grounded in the music, so it becomes easier to do this. So this is an extreme example because of how very resonant this is. And we've got a very low ceiling here, so the sound is bouncing all around. So it's challenging to keep that clarity. But if you wanted to get more closely attached to it, using the headphones becomes very useful. So the size and the timing of your articulations, the number of them, being careful not to clip too much, and a close monitoring depending on your registration. Um, other proprioceptive variables, I think, uh, tend to be you know, things like glitches in the operation, like you get crackles in the sound, you may get notes that don't play, your sound setup might cut out if you've got a weird driver on your audio interface and it, and it, and it uh, f f breaks down on you. Um, you know, all, it might not seem like a big deal, but it creates tension in your body. It creates disorientation. It interrupts uh, your flow, it can derail your coordination, all of those things. So it's important to be aware of that. So don't be, a, don't be surprised if it feels different. Pay attention to the sensations that you have in your body when you play. And just be prepared to work a little harder to, to overcome uh, that, that experience of the physical distance from the sound. Um, you know, you can have the experience of doing quite a lot with your touch and getting very little back. Uh, so you've got to be prepared to choose your sample sets very carefully and uh, very often uh, uh, using headphones to monitor the response. So there's a, a sort of a dull, numb feeling that you can sometimes get from the keyboard, um, which you wouldn't get on an acoustic instrument necessarily, uh, that you have to overcome uh, usually in the, in the timing and, uh, of your releases and then how big they are. Are there any questions? about that yet? Okay, so I think, did you have a question? Yeah. So as a practicing student, how practical is it to transfer to headphones and acoustic instruments? Because it's different from Well, here's the thing. The, 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 the fact that you're thinking about articulation and body balance, gravity, and coordination as you play in order to make uh, the, the instrument sort of obey your, your attack and to get it to respond predictably is a transferable skill no matter what instrument you're playing. So if you have an instrument that just inherently is responsive and it's not requiring you to do any of that, you might not necessarily actually be thinking about that. So this is one way where the disruption can actually strengthen you, but it does require that you adapt. You know, there is a pedagogic approach that really talks about, well, just, just play. Sit down here and play your piece. Sit down there and play your piece. And I hear it all the time. Uh, in, in, my, in my work, um, students who do that. They don't necessarily listen to what the instrument is giving back to them because what they are, it's about what they are doing, what they're going to sit down and do. And I find you don't always get the, the most out of an instrument that way. So this does kind of amplify the need to do that somewhat. Okay, so registering carefully also obviously is very important here, right? There are many ways to do this. It could reshape how much reverb, how much disorientation recurs. Uh, so that segues us into, I think, nicely into the idea of uh, uh, the tactile arena of your experience. <clears throat> so in the, in the virtual platform, the, the, the thing that's so different about it is that the, the, the touch, your touch, has to adapt to auditory feedback rather than tactile feedback. A really good instruments especially mechanical instruments, give you really strong feedback uh, in the keyboard. So the keyboard's physically connected to the speech of the pipe, and you can feel kind of a percussive effect on the release of the key related to the closing of the palate or even just the mechanism closing under the, under the, the tracker. So, <clears throat> or even the, the sound of a relay firing and closing a, a pneumatic and closing the palate that way. There's, uh, there's more... Uh, a direct mechanical sensation in the finger when you play an acoustic instrument. Here, you're really generally not getting that. So what you need to do is be monitoring what you're hearing and have that shape what you're doing. So it's, it can be quite disorienting. It can disorient, again, your rhythm, your coordination, and your accuracy. Um, now, this is not just a factor necessarily of the latency of your software. 
you could have a really, really good setup with zero latency, nearly, you know, buffered, you know, uh, uh, minimally and, and have a very, very direct connection and still feel uh, tactilely disoriented. Um, so this is one thing you just have to adapt to. You just have to create new associations, again, between what you're doing and what you're hearing, but focusing primarily on what you're hearing. You'll get varied uh, responsiveness, uh, uh, again, depending on the registration and the, uh, the sample set. Oh, it's really due to the fact that you're playing by wire. There's no, there's no physical link to a speaking pipe. Um, so it, it's just requiring a different approach. So if I were to just, you know, some highly filigreed thing with a sort of fat registration, say. pleasant full sound, but also not a lot of uh, contact with the speech of the pipe. So if you want to create a lot of uh, detail there, it becomes uh, difficult to do. So a thinner, th choose your registrations carefully based on the sample set. Some of them will give you more or less of that detail. something unconventional. Uh, you have lots of options in terms of couplers and, and supers and unisons off. So so thinking and playing around with what the sample has given you in terms of clarity and detail and variety uh, of speech uh, is very important in making in extracting as much expressivity from the sample. So not going at a, well, it's eight and four, and, it's, and that's, what I, that's what I'm gonna do because that's what I do. Think about what does it feel like? How much detail do you want? What are your options? And, and really explore those all. Um, so this is, I think, important. There's also, I think, this idea of um, uh, varied responsiveness to ornamentation, I think, is really important. You'll have different sample sets that are more or less responsive to um, uh, trills. So you've got to think about what, how do you play those? How do you adapt to them to get what you want to hear, not what you're used to doing? So. Suppose you're doing some piece of degree. Used to really tightly wound trill in your hand, right? Like you do it on a harpsichord. Um, well, that's pretty responsive, but not as clear. So, what do you do then? The approach to something like an ornamentation is typically what I found is to just slow it down a little, take a little bit more time with the with the with the ornament, and. is a little bit more noticeable before, before the trills. So these kinds of small adjustments are necessary uh, that aren't necessary when you're playing with a highly responsive instrument. But here, you're responding very carefully to what you're hearing in terms of the reaction. So if the trill sounds doughy and you're not getting clarity between the notes, then you want to adapt the speed, the velocity of the trill, and the uh, number and placement of articulations before and after them. Okay, there's an issue that we get uh, with, uh, with the plano. In, in an acoustic instrument, when we want a, a rich plano, you know, uh, like this piece, for example, I mean, um, do I have it set up? I think I did. 
There it is. Um, we have this idea in acoustic instruments that in order to create richness in your sound, you simply create a, a, a more legato touch. So you're able to roll chords. The idea of, of letting the instrument sing more by increasing the contact time between your hand and the keyboard is a, is a go-to technique for uh, richness, creating richness in the plano. It typically does not work in the virtual environment because it doesn't have that, that same uh, immediacy in the response to the hand. So you have to be prepared to really amp that up. So experimenting with over legato in your touch in order to really increase the amount of time that the pipes, that the pipes are speaking. Uh, this becomes something that you need to do to a very pronounced degree in the virtual platform uh, that you really don't when you're playing acoustically. Um, any questions there? All right. So spatial, the spatial arena. So everything that has to do with um, the uh, experience of the, uh, of the sound uh, generated in the synthetic acoustic. I think the, when you're in the spatial arena of your experience, you're really thinking about ultimately the limitations, whatever your various limitations are uh, in the quality the quantity of attack and release samples. And what do I mean by that? In, in the technology, when they're sampling instruments, they'll take numerous samples of the attack, the sustain, and the release of each pipe. So if you have a very uh, slow speaking stop, for example, but it's not always slow speaking, a really good sample is going to create multiple samples of the attack of that note. So it will capture the reality that when you're playing it, sometimes middle E goes wah, and sometimes it goes squaw, and sometimes it goes pa, and maybe it doesn't work on the fourth time. So the samples will catch, catch all of those. So when you play it, you're getting all of those. Every time you play the E, you're going to get a different one of those samples. So they'll sample the attack, like I just demonstrated or told you about, the sustain, the sustained sound of the pipe speaking, and the release. So every time you release the note, that same middle E, the first time you do it, it might go wah, and then it might go wah, and another time it might go wah, right? And all of those things are different. Now, you might find that you can control that when you play. So if you release really fast on that middle E on the acoustic instrument, you'll get the chiff. If you release softly or slowly, you won't get the chiff. So you can choose how much chiff you get based on what you do with your touch. Here, that doesn't work. Sometimes you'll get more reproducibility than others. It depends on the sample set. But most of the time, that response is randomized by the technology. So you're not going to get that same kind of immediate control, that precise control over a sample set. Though I would say that the best sample sets will try to make it so that the samples don't have so much variety so that you notice them that dramatically. And what you get instead is some variation in the way that the pipes are speaking enough not to disorient you and also and not too much to disorient you, but enough to give you a sense that you're actually playing an instrument. So I found that some of, the, some of the samples are actually extremely good at this, so that you get really almost no perceptible change uh, from an acoustic instrument. So th this really is, uh, it's very, very impressive when it's done well. Um, you'll have a, a larger number of attack and release samples on certain sample sets that are randomized by the software. And then you'll also get lower, what I would consider lower quality sample sets, sometimes they're free, you don't have to pay for them, but this is usually why. Because they sampled this instrument that has the middle E that goes wah, and so every time you play that note, you are going to hear that. And that, I will tell you, will drive you crazy. So be very careful about choosing your sample sets because this can really impact your experience. If you start listening, once you hear it, you cannot unhear it. 
And so it's just a warning that it's usually worth the investment in experimenting. But I would say, yeah, go ahead. I just had a question. Yes. What's your views on composite sets? Uh, could you explain a little more? Uh, how Right, so this is a this is a very interesting frontier um, where we're talking about creating a new instrument, really synthesizing a new instrument that is a hybrid of different instruments. Um, I think it's fa fabulous. I think it's it depends what you want to do with it, right? If you're looking to have an experience, an auditory experience that is a reproduction of an acoustic instrument, it can be frustrating to have that, but for a composer, it can be totally indispensable as a tool because then you, you can create your own instrument that does all kinds of uh, things that you could never do with, with a different kind of instrument. And we'll talk about some of those shortly, yeah. I was just wondering like, how much a good sample usually costs. It depends on the size of the instrument. So the pricing, what I've typically found, the pricing is related more to the number of stops than the quality of the sampling. So I found, for example, Helmut Meyer is a professor he ran in Germany who runs uh, Organ Art Media, and it's a, uh, an organization that is more in the archival business. Um, I perform, you see it on YouTube, I, a performance that I did of uh, Spanish, uh, a, 17th, 15th, a 16th century Spanish, one keyboard instrument. I mean, the sample costs about $250, but it's one of the best ones I've played, precisely for the number of samples that have been made. Um, it's small uh, in terms of its uh, memory requirements because it's a one manual instrument with a small number of stops. But they speak so well. It's really, it is phenomenally good. And so, but you have, you know, something like this or uh, the, another, the Martini Kerk in Hrenigen, you know, these massive uh, instruments that have a lot of stops that are about $800 to $1,000. So, but I would tell you, for example, my personal feeling uh, is that the uh, sampling for the Spanish instrument, the one manual Spanish instrument for $250 is 10 times better than the sampling for that big instrument. But if you want the experience, the auditory experience of the, of the, of the larger instrument, well, then you're getting that and it's terrific. But in terms of how it feels, it's a very different experience. And a more, for me, it was a more frustrating one. So the range uh, in price is usually about 200 to about $1,500. Uh, the real challenge to playing these is actually the memory that they need and, and having a computer that has enough of it to run a sample set. Uh, you know, I thought I was a big shot with 33 megs of RAM until, <laughs> until I realized that you know, some of these, like this one, uh, require much more. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, The samples uh, themselves uh, are expensive, but not the most expensive aspect of the tech. Um, and so you've raised some interesting questions that I'd like to address in terms of just the kind of the ethics of this and, 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 and what should we do because we can. Um, uh, but I just want to just finish up here with the, the idea of spatial in, in the few minutes that we have. Um, so we're, when we're talking about the impact on the spatial arena, we're talking really about the sampling. And so it's very, very important if you're going to choose one of these samples that you spend time not only with its sound or its stop disposition, but in terms of its response and how and listen for things that stick out. And I would say uh, finding uh, samples that try to not either not have a lot that sticks out all the time, but have a, a variety and certain uh, uh, a certain. Um, a sense of realism uh, that you experience as a result of that. So be aware of how much realism are you feeling here? Does it feel two dimensional? Does it feel um, a, what I would call undersampled, where, where the sound is too uniform, it's too binary. The note is on or off, there's no variation in, in, in how the, the pipes are speaking. And you can also have this kind of over randomization, this is what I would call a, a illogical repeatability, where you have every time you play it, you're getting something that's really noticeably different, but you're not really doing anything that different. That can be disorienting too. So this sort of middle of the road, where you get enough detail but not too much, I think is, is, is how to get into a situation where you will be able to extract the most expressivity from the technology. 
Um, okay. So, you know, I, I think, as I've said, I think the, the, the advantages here are, are significant. They make us engage instruments more thoughtfully. The, the technology has the ability to do that, take us out of that play and go approach to interacting with them. We're thinking more uh, carefully about the space that we're in uh, when we're trying to make it work here and that we move into an acoustic space and we're thinking more about that space as well. There's an advantage there. Um, I think that there are advantages to having the sound coming from the listener's perspective rather than from our perspective at the console. We become more sympathetic to our listener and what they're experiencing when they're hearing us play. So this can be good, as useful as hearing a recording of yourself in a very similar way, except that it's happening in real time. I mean, in our final minutes, I sort of, I like, you know, these, this idea of the haunting questions of this technology, and that is, you know, what should we be doing? Should we be trying to recreate an instrument that has been built and just respecting that? And so if there are no pedal couplers on the original instrument, but Hauptwerk will let you have them, should you use them? If there's no four foot, if there's no supercut, if you want a 16 foot Bourdon on your grate and there isn't one here, but you have a subcoupler that will let you have a Bourdon 16, like you ask someone like me, I say, have at it. This is the beauty of the technology is that you can do it. You're not trying to recreate something that is acoustic. Once you accept the fact that this is a different beast, you are liberated to really explore what the technology can do. So I strongly encourage whether that is creating a hybrid instrument or doing things to this instrument that you can't do otherwise, I think it's very important to allow yourself that ability for the purpose of being more expressive, right? Um, th this, this idea of ethics, I mean, you know, they might not have built that 16-foot Bourdon because they didn't have the money for it back in 16 diggity 3. So does that mean that you should just not do that? You should just not want those things, right? If it was because of a financial limitation. Now you have the money. The person who built your Bruce Burke might have succumbed to plague before they had a chance to fill the, the division in with pipes. So it only goes, starts at F. So does that mean that, oh, you should only start at F? But now you can have the whole keyboard. So this is something that the virtual tech can provide to us that I think is important to give yourself permission to do. Approach this as a different beast. And I think you will be able to really uh, explore the full capacity, the expressive range of this instrument. Think about how it feels in your body. Pay close attention to what you're hearing in the space. What does the instrument feel like on your finger? Knowing that it's very important to try your sample sets very thoughtfully, exploring this fine level of detail so that you get something that will be very satisfying to play and help strengthen you as a musician. I yeah. think there's a way to have an instrument in my home that sounds like a pipe organ. But we're so limited now to buy a keyboard, like a decibel or a you know, roll, or whatever. Mm -hmm. The have, have said they are already used. This seems to be something that will open up unrestricted limits. I think you know there, this, the the real key I think aspect of this is the is the sampling, and I mean the fact that you can interact with samples of of different kinds of instruments, um, and get a sense of how of the whole language of registration, uh, you know you can experiment with that without worrying about someone. I will tell you that my personal experience when I first started uh, working with this technology, it was triggering for me <laughs> to be in what was an acoustic, a synthetic acoustic, but experimenting with sounds and thinking, I hope no one downstairs gets upset, but I hope I'm not annoying. You know, I hope no one's going to start screaming, what are you doing? <laughs> what is that? And stop doing that. And why are you playing? Why are you using the Shemad like that? I mean, you know, this, it, it can be that real. And uh, uh, so the uh, other t platforms that I find, the digital platforms, various other kinds of samples, um, they, they don't uh, really look at trying to capture so many different aspects of the speech of the instrument. 
So I'm finding right now some of the other technology out there, it feels a little bit one dimensional to play for that reason, for the reason of the, the lack of variety in the sample. You had a question. Well, do you have the I don't, Fratilla. I don't have it. It's not loaded into yeah. this. Um, but I did uh, do a. I have a streaming series on YouTube, and I did a concert using it, so you can hear it there. It's all Spanish instrument. Yeah. Thank you. This has been so useful. Thank An you. existential <laughs> question. <laughs> Please. We've got a colleague in Oregon Prof at a smaller university somewhere in Ontario. Okay. They have a 1916 Lega that's failing. They have not got the money to fix it. Would you advise that colleague to teach on that system? I would, actually. I think, I mean, the, you know, it depends on the context always, right? There are some advantages to saying, well, better to get a continual organ. I am right up there with those who would, I would rather have one absolutely beautiful eight foot principle. And I will live out my days very happily on an eight-foot principle. You know, that's me. That's a personal thing, a continual instrument um, with a short octave. And, you know, it costs what it costs, but I don't need no fancy whatever else, right? I mean, but in a setting, a pedagogic setting, where you want to be able to really get someone into the athleticism of the instrument, um, feel a sense of space, get uh, um, literate in... Uh, console management, coordination, uh, training and registration, exposure to different national styles of, of voicing and registration. Uh, how can you do that on a three-stop practice organ? I'm sorry. I mean, it's just, it is really a compelling question. So it depends on who the students are, what the environment is. Uh, but I don't think that a, uh, a subpar uh, acoustic instrument is inherently superior to this. It just is a different kind of instrument. So we, there is existential and ethical questions around that in terms of preserving the art of organ building and, and advocating for the importance of it, which I am uh, very vocal in doing. But I don't think that these need to be in competition. I don't see them as the same thing whatsoever. Um, and in certain cases, I think one is more appropriate than the other. Yeah. It's a, it's a tricky question, and, and uh, I, think, I think things are changing. I think, you know, if we're talking about these barriers to access, which, uh, as I started at the beginning here, which are significant barriers. So, I mean, we're talking about the inspiration of someone coming from piano. A lot of what I do at the Faculty of Music is bring people who are non-specialists in organ into organ, and some of them have ended up with doctorates, actually, one of them you can hear perform today, Roy Thompson Hall. So, you know, this is, this is a really important question. Giving someone exposure to an, an opportunity to fall in love with what the instrument does so well, and that is explore sound, play around with sound, the palette of colors, all of these things that we have all fallen in love with uh, because of, because of the, the whole concept of the organ's uh, orchestration, the whole ask the whole uh, MO of organ being one of uh, uh, orchest a very orchestral type of an instrument uh, where we're playing with sound and combining sound and, and, and exploring all of those other, other things that organ does so well. Make us sensitive to counterpoint. Make us sensitive to harmonic rhythm and rhythmic architecture. Um, you know, uh, make us sensitive to melodic lines and shapes and contours. Uh, because of the nature of the repertoire. You know, organ is very distinct in, in the way that it builds musicians to have those sensitivities. So you're simply not going to get that same experience unless you actually have an instrument, unless you can actually play it. And we have so many examples of people who simply just can't get into the instrument. They can't get onto the console. Do not touch. So, you know, yeah. All right. Yes. As you said as well, yeah, this is something that the technology can do. Uh, I have not personally explored that aspect. Of it. Yeah, I think there are some changes. Yep. Yeah, it's quite an involved, elaborate process to do that, um, but. I believe that in the more recent versions of the software, it is possible to do that. Yeah. 
other questions? Okay. Well, there's open console sessions here uh, today. You can speak with Johnny uh, uh, for coordinating that access. Uh, there's a sheet on the table there for getting to your next uh, events. And uh, thank you for being here and for listening. And uh, please reach out if you have questions. Thanks so much. Enjoy the day. Thank you.